Welcome to Imagine Wealth Without Risk, the podcast that guides you to fulfilling your dreams through guaranteed, secure investing. Here's your host, Ted Thomas. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Imagine Wealth Without Risk. Now, this podcast is about making money with tax lien certificates and tax deeds, which are really tax defaulted property. Now, I also include an interview with a special guest on how to create new income on other unrelated business. Now, I do that in order to help you grow financially and help to give you new ideas. Now, if you're wondering why I would do that, it's because the business of tax lien certificates and tax deeds, after you've learned the process, is really a part-time job. Usually, most people spend five to 10 hours a week, so uh, this isn't going to be full-time. Once you learn how to do it, you'll spend a little time, and the auctions are always scheduled, so you can schedule your time pretty well around this. Now, if you're going to go into the fixer-upper business, that's a whole new ball game, and I don't recommend that. I do recommend you buy the tax-defaulted properties. You just buy them low, and then if you can, sell them quickly to a fixer-upper person or someone like that. Now, am I negative on fixer-uppers? No. I'm just trying to caution you because fixer-uppers require so much cash. You're always putting up money, and uh, there's a good chance you'll run out of money right in the middle of the project, and what's going to happen then? It's then you're going to lose your money or something. I don't want that to happen. So I like people to start, buy a property, and then quickly resell it. Today, I'm going to do something a little different. In my past podcast, we talked about tax lien certificates. We talked about tax deeds, which are tax defaulted property. Today, I'm going to talk about redeemable tax deeds. Now, let me say that again. Redeemable tax deeds, which they sell in Georgia and Texas. And I'll, I'll tell you about the different states that do that. But right now, let's narrow it down to Georgia because this is unusual. So these states don't do what tax lien states do, but they pay pretty nice rates of return. For example, Georgia is a redeemable tax state. So that means you go to the auction, visualize yourself there, you're raising your hand, you're buying a tax deed. Now, a tax deed, as you remember, that's the conveyance device between the county transferring the property to you as an individual. So you're buying a tax deed, however, it's redeemable. Oh my goodness, this is a whole new ballgame, right? Now they do the same thing in Texas, which I won't cover right now, but you're getting the idea. So right now let's just do Georgia. So Georgia has a redeemable deed. So you buy it anytime in that one year period after you've purchased it, the property owner can come forward and redeem that tax deed that you bought. In other words, they can come and buy it back, just like what happened with a tax lien. However, the state is not too benevolent about this. The penalty when that property owner comes back and redeems the deed is 20%. So that means if you raised your hand, you bought a tax deed, and now the person or the property owner comes in to redeem, they have to give you back all your money and a 20% return. Now, that's not an interest rate of return. That's a penalty return. So let's talk about this penalty stuff for just a minute. The penalty is for one day or 365 days. So if you bought a tax lien certificate today and they come in and pay you tomorrow, they have to give you back all your money plus a penalty of 20%. Whereas regular tax lien states, they have amortized rates of a percent and a half a month in Florida or 18% a year. So here's how this works. All of the counties in the state of Georgia, and there's about 159 of those counties, all of them are authorized to sell redeemable tax deeds. Now, every county won't have an auction every month, but the majority of the counties will have auctions, and they do that once a month, usually the first Tuesday of the month. And that's mandated by law. So you can plan on that. So with 159 counties, you're going to have more auctions than you ever dreamed about going to. Now, will they all have 400 properties? No. Some will have six. Some of them have 16. Some of them have 30. It's that kind of thing. But they'll have it every single month. So they're not going to wait to get their money. They're going to get these properties out there and auctioned as quickly as possible. Now, the county is required when they're going to seize or confiscate a property to give due notice to the delinquent property owner. 
So simultaneously, while they're giving due process, giving that notice, they'll also notify the bank or any other lien holder that's recorded at the county records. So that's called any other lien holder that's on title. You don't need all these fancy words right now, but just keep in mind, when anybody has a lien on the property, it's more than likely recorded at the county records. So that would include a lien for a judgment, like in a lawsuit, or a mortgage, or a deed of trust, or a contract of sale. Now those liens are recorded at the county records, okay? Some people say they're filed at the county records. Okay, so continuing, the county will have a process. And the process simply is give notice to the homeowner and give notice to anybody that's on title that they're going to confiscate the property. Now they'll do that by sending written notices. They'll also put that in the newspaper. And of course, they'll publish that on a website. So the newspaper would be called the legal newspaper. Now, I don't know what the legal newspaper is going to be. It could be any number of papers that bid to get that status. So it might be a big newspaper. It might be a small one. It might be multiple. But you could ask at the county and say, what's the legal newspaper? And you could ask at the county, will these be published on a county website? And of course, the answer to both of those is yes. So I've been guiding people uh, through this process for a number of years. And when you first hear about it, you get a little bit baffled. It sounds like it's uh, heavy duty and gonna be hard. It's not, it's really a simple process. But what I'd suggest, if you did have to seize a property or foreclose on a property, I would simply hire an attorney to do that. Could cost anywhere from a thousand to $1,500. Although I just had uh, one of the students tell me it only cost him $250, but that'll be another podcast that we'll talk about. So simply stated, the county will give notice the notice will be published in the newspaper, also published to the county. So now you know there's plenty of auctions. At the auction, they're going to sell a redeemable deed. So if this is the first time you heard that, don't be baffled by all this. They'll start talking about five faves, which are judgments. They'll talking about lien process and whatever. All this will get simplified as, as you read it a number of times. It's not a complicated process, but if you've never been through the legal end of things. It sounds a little bit that way because of the words they're using. Nothing to be afraid of. Nobody's done anything wrong. People have had crises and uh, they couldn't pay their taxes. So the government says, wait a minute, we need some money. So if you don't pay your tax, we're going to take your property and sell it to somebody else. So as I say, it's a little bit different. So let me do a quick review. The county will sell a redeemable tax deed. Now you got that. They'll do that once a month in the state of Georgia. Okay, there'll be hundreds, literally thousands every year. Keep in mind, the county only wants money to pay the bills for the county, and that's what they're after. So today I'm discussing a penalty states. So there are states we call tax lien states, and there's other states we call them tax deed states, and now I've got another name. There's a penalty state, all right? And I'll have another one as we go along. But right now, we just want to narrow, narrow it down. We know there's tax lien states, there's tax deed states, and now there's redeemable states. Now in the redeemable state, you can buy the certificate and you might have to hold it. If you hold it one year in Georgia and the people decide they want the property, they have to come in and pay you whatever you paid plus 20%. That's a penalty return. Now, if they haven't paid you by the 366th day, in other words, one day into the new year, it's no longer redeemable at 20%. It's redeemable at 30%. And if they go after the second year goes into the third year, then it's redeemable of 40% and then 50%. I'm sure you're getting the idea. Okay, now the county only wants their money. If they don't get paid, they're going to issue a redeemable deed. If you don't get money, you're probably going to have to get an attorney and do something about foreclosing on that property. Now, I'm not going to tell you to do that on your own. I'm gonna tell you, take your time, let an attorney help you. It's not difficult. The property owner may not be anywhere within a thousand miles, okay? The deed is basically sold at auction. You buy it and you can keep in mind that the owner could come forward at any time and pay you. When they do pay you, 
your minimum rate of return, let me say this to you a couple of times, your minimum rate of return is 20%. Now, I don't know any place you're going to get 20%, but here's one right here in Georgia. Later, when I talk about Texas, it's 25%. Now, keep this in mind. If you bought the deed and they come in 10 days later, you're still going to get your 20%. They come in 150 days later, 20%. You're always going to get that rate of return. So these are powerful ways to make money. Now, I know it's a little confusing, but just relax. It's new. The business is new to you. Not difficult to do. When you invest your money, you're going to invest it directly with the state. In other words, your money is protected by the state and by the property tax code. That redemption is something that the county and the state is doing to keep people from losing their asset. They don't want people to lose their property. So when the people come in to pay, you're going to make a nice return. 20% return, you'd like to do that all day long. If you don't get paid, you're going to get the property, and then you can go on and resell it, and you'll be able to resell it without a mortgage in many cases. Okay, so I spent a little time on Georgia. If I talked about the Carolinas or I talked about Texas or Rhode Island, each one of those states will be a little bit different. There's five penalty states. The big ones for doing this are Texas and Georgia. So that's something you'll want to start thinking about in your portfolio. First year is 20%. Second year, you make 30% and 40% the year after. All other states are not paying penalty states penalties. They're going to pay amortized rates of return. So Georgia's unique. Texas is unique. Rhode Island's unique. Ohio's unique. And so is Indiana. So I started this all back in 1989. And this has certainly become sophisticated since then. In those days, and I'm not bragging, believe me, at that point in time, we had to drive to the county, and then we had to go to the treasurer's office. And when we got there, we had to request a tax lien list or a tax defaulted list or a redeemable property list. And we had to go through all that. And they might have to print it for us because not a lot of people did that. But then we, after we got the list, then we proceeded into the county records room and the map room, and we would look the properties up. And then once we looked them up and we had the property uh, identification numbers, then we would start looking up the property in the files and find out if there were any liens on the property, whatever. And so that took us some time, not only just to get to the county, but to uh, go through all these different offices. Now with the computer systems we have, we not only can teach you to do that online, We can give the learning systems online. So I have learning systems. I call them distance learning. For example, my intensive business growth system. And we teach people how to buy property online. And we teach them how to do all this research online. So you're getting the idea. This is pretty pretty healthy business and a way for you to make money. Now, fortunately for you, the counties have become organized. And they're used to people requesting this information online. I can tell you stories. I won't today about treasurers that actually retired on the job. And I'm not making a joke. For example, in Douglas County, Nebraska, something happened with the treasurer, I don't know what, but they didn't auction any properties for five or seven years. And then finally, the Board of Commissioners found out there was properties all over the county that they hadn't confiscated and resold that were deteriorating and nobody was paying taxes. When taxpayers find out that others aren't paying taxes, I can tell you they get pretty darn cranky. Those properties all had to be sold at fire sale prices. They had the same situation in Jacksonville, Florida, and they ended up with 8,000 property or a number like that that were not being taxed and were not being resold. And when the new treasurer was voted in, thank goodness, she sold those properties for five cents on the dollar. So all kinds of weird things happen. And you'll hear me say it in my three-day workshops, you're entering the world of the weird. And sometimes when I explain these things, people say, are you crazy? I'm not. And so now you've learned another new way to make money. So we've learned about tax lien certificates. We've learned about tax deeds. Now we've talked about redeemable deeds. So we're getting step-by-step through this process. I hope you learned a lot on this particular session. And if you have questions, you just remember, go to info at tedthomas.com, info at tedthomas.com. And I answer those questions every morning. So you'll always have an answer in 24 to 48 hours. Okay, I'm Ted Thomas. Welcome aboard. We're glad to have you. 
Hi, everyone. I'm glad you're on the call today. What I haven't had a chance to do is introduce you to Coach Crystal, and she's not only an expert at tax liens and tax deeds, but she's got a lot of business experience. And from time to time, she actually helps us out and takes a, a class through one of the events that we do. We do what we call buying tours, where we actually go and students get to buy at the auction and so on. And Crystal is one of the people that guides people through that over two or three days. So I don't want to take any of her thunder away. Crystal, welcome to the call. Thank you, Ted. Oh, good. Now tell us a little bit about you, and it's okay to brag a little bit, because my people all want to know about all the people that work in our organization. Even Lance, who's in the background doing technical, he's going to be on a call like this. And Kim's going to be going. We're going to have everybody on a call so customers get to know who we are and what have you. And this is a podcast that I do once a week, and you and I are only about 15 or 20 minutes of the podcast. The rest of it's experts from all around the world. But we start each time with me going blah, 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 a little bit about tax liens and deeds. But I want to make sure that I've showcased every one of our coaches. And you've been an important part of what I've been doing now for, I'm going to say 10 years or more. So please don't say much, much more than 10 because I'm getting old. Anyway, so tell us about you. Ted, I'm going to say something else first, and then I'll okay. answer your question. Okay. You mentioned the buying tours. Yes. And I have to tell you, and I think I have told you this and others in the office and talked to the coaches about this, but I've done several buying tours. Uh -huh. And I've got to tell you the difference between the first one that we did uh -huh. and the last one that I did was the difference of night and day. It oh. is amazing how much or how well prepared the clients attending those tours are when they arrive. The first one we did, Everybody was just still learning and starting starting at the beginning. Right. But the last one I did, it was amazing. Before we even started the buying tour, people had done research on properties. They were they had their list. They had viewed properties. And it was amazing because what it allowed us to do is skip some of the rudimentary things. And right. only because there were people that were all at that level. It's just how it worked out. But I was so impressed because you have so many different opportunities for people to learn. Right. And right. the buying tours, it was just amazing. So we got to take some a little trip down to the county records because one of the things the clients had said, you know, here's what we're concerned about. I said, okay, if everybody's good with that, here's what we'll do. Right. So they were really happy about that. And it was a lot of fun, and it really helped them. They were so much more advanced. So I think that um, tells you that the training's doing well. Yeah, so. well, that business of, uh, that they have to come to class before they go on the buying tour really made the difference. So, yeah, I'm glad to hear you report that back to me. Okay, tell me about you and tell everybody about you, because some of the people that, that haven't had a chance to have coaching with you don't know who you are, and I want to make sure they do know who you are. Who am I? I live in Northern California, and I'm a small town girl. I'm a native Californian. My husband's a native Washingtonian. The first 14 years we were married, we lived in Washington State. Then, as I say, when I came home and brought him along with me, I remember overhearing him tell someone, one of his friends in Bellevue, Washington, that, yeah, we live in a small town. And then he said, and we don't even live in town. <laughs> <laughs> because we live out in the country, and that's by choice. Good. That's exactly where I want to live. I grew up with an employee mentality, and I've worked in a, a variety of different industries and type jobs, but primarily administrative type skills and details. Yeah, that's part of it. That's just part of the mentality. Got that from my mom. And then when we moved to California, I got a job at a, a small mid-sized publishing company and I worked there for a while and I worked for it was the administrative assistant to the CFO the chief financial officer and she said we're going to get an integrated accounting and information system and I'd like you to set it up for us I'm going okay don't know anything about it but let's give it a shot and basically I put my life on hold for a year it, it wow. took a whole year Wow. And then my boss, the CFO, had gone on to other things, and I had a new boss. And uh, one Friday, he uh, wanted to talk to me, and uh, he said that um, you don't need to come in on Monday. Oh. 
And I, I said, really, that's okay, because I had worked so much uh, time that I had comp time. I said, I just took some time off, you know. Um, I'm really okay. I can come in on Monday. He says, no, you don't understand. You don't need to come in at all. I said, oh. And I was shocked. I had never been fired or laid off from a, a job. Oh. And I knew the company was having challenges. They were having financial challenges. After all, I did accounts receivable and accounts payable. I knew what was going on. And I was just amazed and more than a little irritated because I had just put my whole life on hold for a year working horrifically long hours. All right. So let me review because I'm impressed with what you just said. Really impressed because you're really... I didn't know the story. And how long have we been together? Please don't say more than 10 years. But anyway. Well, slightly more than 10 years. (laughs) Slightly more. Okay. So I didn't even know that story after all this time. So I'm happy. I'm delighted that you shared it with me. And I'll share it with the clients that are on the podcast. However, there's a lot of things that took place there that I want to review and make sure that to hit home with these people. Because I was going to talk a lot about coaching. And I still am before we get done here. But so you went through some adversity. And so you're familiar, you haven't ever told me this before, but you're really familiar with, you went through what my clients go through. My clients go through this euphoria of, oh, Ted's told me how to make profit, profits. I can buy for 10 cents on the dollar. or I can make 24% of my money and all that. They go through this euphoric time And then you have the job of bringing them into reality and saying, yeah, you do, but you have to do a little bit of work. And guess what? It doesn't work perfect every time. It's not that the system is bad. It's just that you don't know how to use it. You're a perfect coach in that regard. And I never realized all this. So that's pretty darn amazing. So let me take you off subject for a minute if I can. And I I really do thank you for sharing that. Tell me about, just tell me a little bit about um, how you encourage. I didn't even think of this line of questioning until I sat here and listened to you. but How do you take these, like I bring the students in and we give them lots of home study materials and we give them calls they can listen to and videos to watch and all that. But when the rubber really hits the road or when they really, where they really accelerate their learning is when they finally get on that phone call with you. So how do you encourage these people and keep them moving forward? We've never talked about that and I'm anxious to hear it. When I have my first call with a coaching client, I need to learn more about them because everything as a coach that I do is based upon what they've done, where they're at, and the information they need. Now, sometimes I made the comment, (laughs) and if somebody takes it the wrong way, they'll think that there's not a method to the madness. But when I pick up the phone to go on a coaching call with someone, I don't have a set lesson plan. I don't know what we're going to talk about. I know we're going to talk about something that the client needs because it's all about them. It's not about me. It's about them. If it wasn't, I want to be a coach. Right. Depending on what they've done and where they're at in the process, then that depends on what we talk about. Usually I'll say, hey, what's been happening since the last time we talked? And uh, we'll do a recap of the steps that they've taken. And... If sometimes something surprises me, what I've learned after several years (laughs) is that I can judge things by if it surprises me. If I'm surprised to hear something, I can't say that it's not accurate, but I do know I want the client to go back and verify that information. And almost always they'll say, oh, yeah, they didn't understand what I asked or I didn't understand what they said. This is what they said when I clarified it. That's the the radar of just working with people over time and knowing uh, how this works and my own experiences. And so that helps. We're always looking at what they need. Now, reason why there's no net lesson plan is because people start at different places in this process. And especially with IBGS and the other programs that you've got available now, that coaching, yes, I do education on the things that they need to learn about when they're at that point. But to me, it's about implementation because you've got the wonderful educational programs that are available, the videos and the resources, they're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. 
they can go back and watch them once. They can watch them twice. They can watch them when they get to something that involves sales. They can watch that again. So it's about implementation, and the support resources are there already. So implementation, so that's why it depends on where they're at. Now, somebody that's a coach now is Bill Beddoes. And as before uh, Bill joined the coaching program, as a client, he had purchased a number of properties right. in Michigan, right? right. He, he had bought, he had no problem buying, <laughs> but he did have challenges selling. Now I mentioned his name and the situation. Normally I don't do that, but he and I talked publicly and in, in your events about this and it wouldn't have not done me any good or him any good to call and say, okay, here's the lesson plan today. Here's what a tax deed is. Here's what a tax lien certificate is. He'd already bought tax deed properties. He only already had ownership. What he needed, he needed to sell. Right. So that's where we started. So starting where they're at and moving forward, and then questions, understanding what their, what their why is. Why are they doing this and why now is so important. People want freedom, financial freedom, and financial freedom might be a little bit different. I learned with my experience of consulting, I had accomplished something that was exactly what I didn't want. I was gone all the time. Right. So I decided at that point that I needed to make some changes. And I saw a TV commercial late at night. I got the information. I started getting some education in real estate. I had none. I knew nothing about real estate other than my husband and I, bought, and I had bought our condo up in Bellevue. Very traditional methods. Got an agent. She showed me properties. Found what I liked. I told my husband. He said, if that works for you, it worked good for him because it was right across the street from the high school too. He said, and we got a very traditional loan. We moved in. When we moved to California, we sold it very traditional, bought a house the same way down here. That was all I knew about real estate. I wasn't even too sure what a deed is. I thought I might know, but I wasn't positive. I had knew nothing about real estate uh, terminology, had no real estate experience. I thought there was, I didn't even know that something other than buying very traditionally in retail type situations, I didn't even know they existed. Hmm. So I have some clients that start out that way. So that's where we start. And you've got some wonderful resources that they can review that really helps with that. Um, but Bill, we started talking about selling. One thing I want to comment on earlier, you said there's some work involved. Yeah. Is it easy? Ah, there's some work involved. Is it really difficult? No, I don't think so. Um, because, Ted, you've got a process that right. people can follow along. You've got the support materials for them. You've got the resources. When you're trying to gather the information that you need to make a, a good, sound investment decision, you need good information. And your materials teach people how to find that information. And then coaches can lead them to the information. And even if it means here, okay, here's the challenge. Here's what we need to know. Here's who you call. And when you call them, ask them these questions. And if they say this, then you ask them this question. If they say something else, ask them a different question. Yeah. And then they get the information that they need. And then we talk about it. Yep, that sounds good. Okay, that's what we wanted to know. It's still on the list. It's still a good choice. Hi, this is Linda. Have you checked out the show notes yet? It gives you the nitty gritty of each episode, provides links to our guest websites, and sometimes you can find bonus items that our guest provides for our listeners. Go to tedthomaspodcast.com to listen to more episodes, and don't forget to check out the show notes. Hi, everyone. It's uh, Ted, and I'm back, and uh, uh, I'm going to introduce you to two people now that I'm not only very proud of, but I'm very excited for you because you're going to learn a lot about tax lien certificates in the next few minutes. Now, as I said on the first part of the podcast, the two individuals we're going to talk about are Drew and his wife, Risha, and they do this together and uh, their team. And I'm not going to steal any of their thunder, 
But I'm going to start out with a question that's unusual because uh, I want to make this as believable as possible. So Drew and Risha, before I actually even introduce you and what great people you are and how well you've done, I want to ask you this question. Did you really buy a tax certificate for $11,000 and it had a, a property attached to it that was worth 180000 and the people did not redeem the tax certificate? That's correct. Correct, yes. Now say that again because my audience is driving in a car and they're not believing it. <laughs> yeah, so imagine being the owner of a tax lien certificate where no one has taken action and no one has actually redeemed. They, they haven't come forward and paid. Yeah. So what do you do with this thing? You're waiting on the predictable, certain, and secure uh, investment. But if you own the lien certificate, you've got to do something with it. Right. And uh, what we decided to do was not worry about how the process is done, but we found someone that was a capable who, and they went through and did everything by the book that was supposed to be done. And we waited and we paid and we waited and we paid. And eventually there was a court date hearing where I was like, oh my goodness, can I actually go attend this thing? And the lawyer said, yeah, sure. Come along, sit in the back, keep quiet. And was able to get to see the whole process go down and the decision get made. And I said, wow. <laughs> you ended up with this property. Is that right? You ended okay. up with the property? All right, yeah. now hold on, hold on, because I got to do an introduction. I haven't done that yet. Okay, yeah. but the answer is you actually ended up with a property valued at $180,000. Yeah. Okay, see, now I've got everybody that's driving the car over to the right lane. They're going to pay attention to me. Okay, because yeah. they're, all, they're all listening. I want to keep them away. All right, so everyone, let me tell you a little bit about Drew and Risha. Of course, they went to school. They're uh, not childhood sweethearts, but close. And they have a handful of kids now. When I met them, they had two. They're already up to three. So if you hear a baby crying, you'll know why, because they, <laughs> they work with the kids. Anyway, these are two people that took action. Now, here's what happens when you listen to a podcast, you hear all this great information, you go to seminars, you read about it, 99% of the people don't take action. The two of these people take action. You already, they're such action takers, they already tell you what they did and I haven't even asked the question yet. All right, so here we go. So Drew and Risha, you guys bought this tax lien certificate and tell us slowly what happened. Now, remember, you guys go at 90 miles an hour, and we got another 29 minutes on this podcast. <laughs> sure thing. Sure thing. <laughs> yeah, great. So tell me what you did. What happened? Okay. As you alluded to, we didn't come to this with any particular background. We were just eager to learn uh, more about this world of investing. And once we got our hands on uh, our first tax lien certificate, we knew that one of two things is going to happen. You're either going to get that interest rate, the return on your money, or... If nothing happens, there's a provision in every county to actually do something with that property, as in change the ownership. So while it wasn't common where we were, we just said, let's find out who knows how to do this. And we found a, a skilled attorney that was able to go through the process and exactly what to do. And they filed the right forms with the courthouse and there all the notices went out and all those steps that you hear about. And we just waited and waited. And eventually there was a time at which it was time for a hearing. And so, they went through it. And so it was actual foreclosure. You actually foreclosed on the property. Foreclosed yep. on the property. Okay. So I tell people, I minimalize it by saying, you either get paid or you get the property. So you are award, actually awarded the property by a court. That's yep. correct. So the court actually said, look, you bought the certificate, you didn't get paid. And so now you get the certificate. That's, That's, right. an, okay. That's an oh my God experience, isn't it? It yeah. absolutely is. All right. So now tell me about this. So this assessed value was $180,000. That's correct. 180000 And you paid 11000 So do you, do you move into the house or do you sell it or what do you do with it? We thought about moving in. Yeah, it was had really we nice. Was been, it nice? Was had it? we not been growing, in, growing our family, we might have. Was it nice? Was it a nice house? Yeah. yeah mint condition. And you describe, describe it to us because we're just driving a car now. Sure. This property was a luxury condominium. It was in a gated community in a growing, stable area of town. Mm -hmm. This whole place was thriving. They were actually building brand new condos, luxury condos in the same development. So the prices and the values of it were just going up and up. It was definitely a winner that we got and everything was inside. It was beautiful. It was not damaged in any way. There were stainless steel appliances. Everything was there. It's turnkey. Wow. So you could just walk up to the door and unlock it and it was yours? Uh, yeah. Bust wow. the lockout or wow. because we didn't have the keys. But yeah. yes, yeah. open the door and it was ours. Wow. That's amazing. Okay. So is this process, first of all, you're buying tax certificates, 90% or no, 99% of the people buy them and the people come in and pay the tax. Most people pay their tax. They don't lose it. 
And so these people, unfortunately, they didn't respond, so they lost the property. And is this a long process? Uh, I didn't uh, think to ask you before the podcast started, but what state did you do this in? This was in Arizona, yeah. Okay, so you do that in Arizona. If I remember right, I'm trying to think back what I wrote in my book, but isn't that about three years before you can foreclose? Yep. yep. So it takes a little while, and then yep. you have to pay the taxes all those years, right? Yep. Okay, so you pay the taxes, and then you don't, you're like me, I, don't, I guess I do now after all these years, I don't know how to do a foreclosure either. So I'd call an attorney, and then yep. you have to go through a legal process, right? Yep. Exactly. Okay, all right, so that doesn't sound too complex, and you have to go to four years of college for this or what? <laughs> no, if I got, did. we did. We but did, but yeah, we probably would have been it. fine with four years of high school. To be honest with you, yep. I, this is really. So here's the question: Is this a scalable business? Absolutely. Yeah. Tell me about that. How would you scale it? Can you well, do you a lot of them? Buy, you can buy as many tax lien certificates as you want. You can buy as many if you are in a different state. You can go after tax defaulted properties, but you can go after as many of these tax lien certificates as you can handle. And all of them, you're either guaranteed a return on it, so your money is going to make money, or you get the property. So even if 99% of the tax lien certificates get paid off and get redeemed, you're still making a good, healthy return on your money, way healthier than you're going to get in many other investments, plus it's secured. Mm -hmm. And then in the 1%, you're going to hit these home runs when you get the property and it's gonna have 180,000 in equity or 169,000 in equity. So you had 169,000 in equity. Oh my yeah. God, wow. Yeah. So I'm always telling my clients and you guys are making me look bad now. I'm always taking my clients and say, look, I'm speaking at this conference. I want you to know this is not a get rich quick scheme. And now how, nobody's gonna believe me anymore. You guys have 169,000 in equity. That's five years pay for the average family. Yeah, right. It yeah. is. Wow. Yeah, wow. Changer. That's pretty amazing. Okay. Now tell us the real nitty gritty now, because everybody's visualizing that you had to break the door down, but you yeah. changed the lock. I already heard you say yeah. that. Change the lock. Now you get in there. What did it really look like? <laughs> it really looked like exactly <laughs> what we described. It was beautiful. Yeah. yeah really? It was, it was so beautiful that we were like, is this really happening? Is this real? Yeah. Is this ours? Yeah. This is ours. Oh my goodness. It's like ours. Oh, oh my goodness. How old do you have to be to do this? Can old funny daddies like Ted Thomas do it? <laughs> I'd say from 18 to 81, and you're not even that old. <laughs> oh, I'm getting close, though. I'm getting close. Okay, all right. <laughs> I'm not even that old. 18 to 81. I got to remember that. Okay. Oh, I'm, just, I'm just recording this for the podcast. So that's great. 18. All right. So all those old funny daddies that can still drive can do this, right? Yes, that's right. Yes. Good business for old people. They can do that. Okay. All right, now you guys are pretty young. Give me a little of your background and stuff like that. Did you guys go to Duke University? Are you Harvard grads or what are you? I'm a wildcat down here in Arizona, bear down. <laughs> oh, are you? All right, good. Okay, so you're a wild guy, okay. And what did you do before? Did you have to have, yeah, what I'm really going to lead to here is does this take a lot of real estate experience? No, some of the least actually, because it's you're trying to study information and find opportunities to be able to get a, a safe, predictable return. So a lot of it is just researching what what the opportunity is that's available. These counties have an auction and they bid off these liens and the lists are available and you just go research and pick out what you want. It's like you're going shopping. And if you're the winner, mm -hmm. guess what? You're in line to wow. get that return or get the wow. property. Wow. All right. So this is sounding pretty exciting. So the average guy can do this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So when you're doing researching, what does that mean researching? Does that mean driving around your car or what? In, in some instances it is because if you're going to be oh. doing tax defaulted properties, you are going to want to drive out to the properties and understand exactly what you're bidding on because you're going after the deed. And in the liens, you still need to know what you're bidding on. So you still need to do your research to understand the type of parcel it is, the size of parcel, the value of the parcel. Is there any structures on it? or not, what the total amount of tax is owed. It's not just that tax year that's owed usually, it's a lot of other years of back taxes. So you do need to still do your research on it and figure out that it is a property that you're gonna want eventually. Because like you said earlier, you have to wait in Arizona, you have to wait three years before you can even foreclose on it. So you just wanna take that into account when you're doing your research. Okay, well, that was a nice explanation. I, in years ago, when I had black hair in those days, I used to take people to the auction in Phoenix. 
Okay. And, uh, don't tell me what county you go to because I don't want any. I don't want uh, people to compete wherever you guys do it. But anyway, they what I would do is I would take the whole class there, and the class thought they would just pick up the newspaper and just choose a whole bunch of these and buy it. I said, no, no, you can't do that. You have to look at the property ID number, right? Yep. Okay. Now, do they call it a property ID number in, in uh, Arizona? What do they call it? PN, assessor's oh, parcel number. Oh, a test assessor's parcel number. Okay, so they look at that, and then they could go in the computer and actually look. In some right. cases, they could see the property. Could you right. see the property before you bought the certificate? Yes. Okay, but if you couldn't see it in the computer, could you go look at it? Exactly. Or they could have gone to Google Maps or the GIS mapping system or something like that. Mm -hmm. you, you you did that on each one. Now, how many did you look at before you got this one? 10, 100, uh, Oh my 50? gosh, the amount of tax liens <laughs> in Arizona that are available are tens of thousands. Yeah, when you oh, go yeah. down, there's have a to narrow book you it can down. look through. Yeah, there's a lot you can go through. So there's a lot, there's a lot of least. So this it is that, I use the word abundance. Is there yes. plenty for everybody? Yes. Yep. Uh, so everybody on my podcast could actually go to Arizona and there would be plenty for everybody. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. All right. So now the key then is what? The key is to do this research. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Can you give us, without telling us what you actually did, I don't want your secrets, but I do want your secrets. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us what you did so we get it. I'd say it's like a common sense approach that one might consider taking to have an idea of what you're looking for, right? So if you're looking at just maybe an entry level property, you're going to think with some common sense things in mind. A low level entry property that's maybe sub 100K or sub 50K is not going to be a lot of taxes on it to begin with. So you're going to be searching that portion of a list that you get from your county. Conversely, if you're saying, hey, maybe I want to look at this in a more abundant fashion and say just because properties on the lower end of the scale price-wise don't get their taxes paid, I would be willing to assume and believe that there's properties on the higher end of the scale that also don't get right. their taxes paid. Right. Um, and we see it all the time. It's the world of the weird. Mm -hmm. So we were more of the type that said, let's find out what's um, more attractive and see if you can't find a diamond in the rough. Ah, so let's see if I remember Phoenix, I used to live over the, I used to have a home at the Biltmore. You guys know what that is, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And what we would do is say to all our clients, if you got the money, buy tax certificates in Scottsdale, yep. because that was all the nice ones. Okay. Yeah. But most of my clients ended up over, over in West Phoenix, over on Dunlap and, uh, and 19, <laughs> past 19th Avenue. And we were, they were buying the bread and butter deals, right? Mm -hmm. so because they didn't have enough money. So if you have enough money, buy a tax certificate in Scottsdale. No worries, because you're yep. going to get a, what a five hundred thousand or seven hundred or a million dollar house or something over there, right? Exactly. Yeah. And here's the secret: I we'd be willing to give away when you learn your county what they generally have is you have there's a science behind those codes. So a lot of times you can look at the code, and if you have a legend or some sort of hack to figure that out by just reading the code and seeing that beginning three digits of the parcel number, you get a chance to get a feel for this is Scottsdale, this is the West Valley, this is downtown. Mm -hmm. And so you can quickly reduce your search time by just narrowing it down to the groups or blocks of parcel numbers that are going to interest you. So yeah. weed out some of the stuff that doesn't even make sense to turn your head. And then that kind of cuts down on the, the research time. Okay, now I know, but I want to hear you say it. The county doesn't hide any of this information, do they? No, not at all. They don't hide it. You can essentially break down any market and there's a coding system based on the APN. And once you understand what maybe those three digits are at the beginning, or it might be a different number of digits in your town, those will generally map to either a pocket of town or a type of parcel. It might be land, it might be commercial and, and have a certain code. But once you learn the coding system, it's like the magic decoder ring. And that's a mm -hmm. hack to fast track your ability to filter properties and, and search for what makes sense for you to research further. That's the difference between a 20 year old explanation and an 80 year old. Took me <laughs> six months to write the book. This guy knows how to do it in a few minutes. All right. So what you've said, let me interpret it for the people driving the car, is all this information is available to everyone and you just got off your rusty dusty and did something. That's right. Yep. Okay. So you didn't have to go to Harvard. You didn't have to go to Yale. And you're not 80 years old and a lot of wisdom. You just were doers. Is that what I've got here? That's right. Yep. It did take us going to a special three-day workshop that gave us some extra. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's my <laughs> workshop to help out. But you got the idea. Thank you for the yeah. promo. That's Very really good. <laughs> okay, good. I, I appreciate that. All right, good. So this is really exciting. So you didn't make just a little bit of money. You made a lot of money 
by doing a lot of research and yeah. having a lot of patience. Right. And you must have some chutzpah, as my friends in New York would say, chutzpah, meaning you've got a little testosterone running through your blood, so you took some action yeah. and it made, made something happen. Okay, all right, now you're saying this is expandable? Sure. Yes, sir. I, I can scale this business. Yeah. Can I do two or three a year? Sure. Easily. You can do two or 300 a year. It depends on the resources you have and uh, really? what you want to do. Wow. Wow. Okay. So was this a one horse pony or have you ever done another one? No, we've done a number of them since yeah. we've done. Oh, uh, a number. Taxes, well, if you, a couple if you taxes. make 150 grand, you don't have to do too many, but are they all 150 grand or where is no, it? No, certainly not. Some of them do redeem and, that, and that's the benefit. I mean, you're still getting that 10, 12%, or even if it's 6%, you're still getting the interest back plus yeah. your principal, which wow. allows you the abundant mentality to go back and swing the bat again, get back at it, get mm -hmm. back at it and roll those profits to be able to do either bigger deals or higher volume of deals. That's right. Okay. All right. So do I have to do this in 10 communities or just one or two? What do you think? What's, whatever you want to do. This is your business. This is your, it's up to you because Drew knows a lot about Arizona. We're, we're from Arizona. I've been oh. here a long time now, so it's like home to me too. But right. also looking at, okay, where are our roots? We have roots in North Carolina. We have roots in Colorado. We have roots other places. So can we expand to those markets and look at which counties are favorable and which ones are not? For instance, we did not go into Boulder County in Colorado because it's not favorable as far as what our exit strategy is. Okay, you can, know, you, so you can, do your can you tell me a little bit about that? Just, just a, a couple of sound bites? Sure, in Colorado, they do a different bidding system. And so you actually are paying higher than, Oh yes. you're paying higher than what the tax lien is for. And then the highest bidder can get the tax lien certificate. Unfortunately, it's the return on them are practically, are very low. They're maybe yes, 1%, yes. something yeah. like that, because you're actually overbidding. Yes. Yeah. Uh, matter of fact, uh, just to plus what you said, which was absolutely right. I used to, I interviewed the treasurer in Littleton, Colorado, mm -hmm. if you know what that is. Mm -hmm. And that was the one that had that bad history in the high school. But yeah. anyway, I interviewed the treasurer there a number of years ago. And uh, that's the only state I tell people to avoid yeah. because people can overbid. They can pay more than the tax liens, even worse. And then mm -hmm. if the people come in and pay their taxes, then they're really in trouble because the people only pay their taxes. They don't pay the overbid. Right. You can actually lose money on a tax certificate in the right. state of Colorado. So I tell right. my clients, and I write that in my book a lot, they should be careful there. So interesting yeah. that you picked that up right away. So Colorado would be a place to not do this. So you do it in a tax. What about a state like Florida? Could they do it in Florida? Oh. All day, because there are lots of tax certificates here. Mm -hmm. Month of May is coming up, and we have one million certificates available in May. Wow. One, wow. one million. Yeah, wow. We wouldn't have to buy too many of them. All yeah. right, so take me on a take me on a little tour of a, another one. And what I'm going to do in my podcast notes, the audience doesn't know this, so I'll tell them right now. Drew and Risha were kind enough to come on to my three-day event. They came on video, actually. Not video, but we did a, a Zoom interview with them. And they actually took us on a tour of the two properties, that uh, one of which we've already talked about, and hopefully they'll talk about the other. We actually took a tour and Risha held up her cell phone and we went through the house and one, one's a great house and the other one's, well, not so good. But mm -hmm. how did you do on that second one? Now you bought a second one. Can we talk about yes. that a little? Sure. Okay. My yes. view, my listeners are going to have in my podcast notes, the ability to go and watch your video that you did oh. in my class. So I hope oh. you don't mind us sharing with them. No. Okay. It's, okay. It's, Tell us about it. number two. On the second one, this was a lower end property. We were into it about 11,000, which is funny that we find properties that were into them all in about 11,000. Uh -huh. um, and this one was worth about 80,000. Okay. Um, it was a tax lien certificate. It's in the state of Arizona. We uh -huh. did the foreclosure and were awarded the property. And in this uh, instance, the previous owner of the property was over leveraged on it. And so that's why they just let it go. They had signed off their desire to have any interest in the property. And then also the banks that had the loans on the property also signed waivers saying that they had no interest in it. So we were awarded the property. Oh. And then, and that was a pretty fast process. That was even faster because we had the, the all the parties involved signing papers. You're an educated buyer at this time, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> You've already been through that foreclosure? 
Yep. Yeah, it okay. felt, felt easier because I we knew the questions to ask or things to look for. We knew the nice, timeline. Nice, nice. So this one, when we got there and it, we were awarded the property, when we got there, it definitely needed work. It was a rehab project for sure. But there was, the air conditioner was still there. It was still a cosmetic rehab. Yep. It wasn't. Good bones. Yeah, it was good bones. There good was bones, yeah. not any super big expense needed. Of course, you so still. A lot of painting and cleaning and that. Did you guys do that? No, we ended up selling it. We ended up selling it to a rehabber in the area. And it was how many days? Nine days? Yeah, it was nine days from the time we. Wow. To, so you really subscribe to my fast bucks, not the last bucks, right? Exactly. That's right. Exactly. You get in and get out, huh? Okay, good. <laughs> and uh, did you make a nice profit or anything? How'd you do on that? We did. We were about 25 grand, 20 mm -hmm. grand. Yep. We sold it for 35 and we were in it for 11, so 24,000. Wow, my goodness. But 200% two, profit's okay and uh, wasn't too long. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Now, those, those fixer upper probably sell pretty quickly down there. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So people shouldn't be afraid of that. They could just sell them to a, do you call those people wholesalers or fixer upper guys? What do you call them? You can sell it to either wholesalers or just flippers. Just flippers. Now they'll buy those quicker. Mm -hmm. So you yeah. can stay in the business that you know the best and keep your hands clean and uh, get your money back. That's the nice part. That's right. Yeah. 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 All right. So that's probably one of the reasons you can scale a business. Yeah. If you have money, you can scale it. When you're doing yeah. fixer uppers, you're bogged down, fixing it up waiting yeah. for your money, waiting for brokers, waiting for all that. Yeah. Okay, so what, what advice would you give uh, newcomers? Obviously, I'm a, I'm a teacher, author, and educator, so I always want people to come to my class, but, but I'm a practitioner like you are. I, I do deals. I'm not sure I've ever made $169,000 on a deal, I'll tell you that. So you guys are really, I'm going to start emulating you if that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Sounds great. Yeah. What other business could you get in that you could make 100000 bucks on? Do you know one? First year? Oof, it's a tall order. I'm sure it's possible, but I can only it's really speak to what I've done. Yeah, like, this is a busy do one. My friend DJ, I think you met him before, but DJ lives in Canada. He said, Ted, most people just want to do one deal a year. I said, yeah. well, in my business, you're going to do four or five, but not with Drew and Rishi. You just do one. Pick one out and pick a nice property in the first place, right? Give our people that are driving their cars right now and they're thinking, oh, I, don't know. I don't know if I want to do this. Tell them where you were and how you got here and what they should do. All right. I guess I, I would probably start with saying that when we first got exposed to the idea that we could even do something like this, it was a little bit overwhelming because we were excited, but we were also scared and thinking with a little bit of that scarcity mentality. And like, oh, I want to do this thing, but what if what happens if it fails? What if it's just some thing that's not going to really <laughs> deliver the way it's touted, even though it's predictable, certain, and secure, and you feel like you stuck. It's one of those things where you have to really believe that it can be possible, especially when you're seeing examples of other people doing it. Mm -hmm. And it's taking that action, saying, I'm going to at least take the action to try. And the biggest tip I would say for people that, that happened for us is we were able to expand our thinking and really apply that abundance and say, this is something that goes on in every country in America. So you don't have to limit yourself <laughs> to the county that you're in if what you're trying to do doesn't map to that county. But yeah. you easy to say, you can't get properties in Arizona because their counties are all about liens. I have to go to a deed state. That's actually not the case. Right. And you'll find that if you just take the action, to at least initiate the learning, you get exposed to that and say, oh my gosh, I can go to this county. It might be a few away, but I could go and bid online and pay with a credit card and be a landowner in the snap of a finger. That's so, right. That's right. Did you ever try to, to tell any relatives about this? <laughs> oh, that didn't work, did it? <laughs> it only started to work once they saw the property. Oh, when, once they saw, oh, they came and saw the property. Yeah, and, and at least pictures. Oh, yeah. oh, the pictures. Okay, they saw the picture. Then they believed you. Yes. Uh, oh, my God. Still, I think it still is hard to fathom that you can do this over and over again. Drew and I can do this one time a year at 100 grand on one property, but that's not what we want to do. We want to do it again and again. It doesn't need to stop after you find that one that year. Let's keep going and find the other one. That's why we've had success in multiple different properties and multiple different tax liens and tax fees. This is why you just keep going. Yeah, I tell people there's so much they can't handle it. We can all compete. We, we, we could compete at the same auction together. It wouldn't even matter. It's just a, enough for everything. I'm going to run out of time in about another minute. Or you should give us some final words and take a woman's perspective on this, if you would, because we don't want to leave you out of the conversation, but Drew and I captured most of it, and we didn't give you a chance. So I want you to tell me from a 
women's perspective, whatever you want to tell me about how people could do this. I, I know you're very much involved in this. Sure. I would say the first thing is that whether you're female or male, your past doesn't define your future. And so you need to let go of what you've done in the past, whether you've done real estate or not, whether you've tried this before or not, whether you've tried another business opportunity or not, it doesn't matter what you've done in the past. Just move forward. This gives me the flexibility to be home with our children. And like Ted said at the beginning of this podcast, we just had our third child. I'm grateful for this opportunity because I'm able to stay home. I'm able to do the research from our home computer. You really don't have to go anywhere. You can have other people go if you need to drive properties, but this gives you the ability to live the way you want to live and you get to design your life. Wow, that was that was quite a statement. Thank you. Uh, we're going to conclude now, but before we do, uh, my guess is I'm looking at the two of you on video, and you make a nice picture. Let me tell you, you both look great. But I'll bet you've got a baby in your lap. He is actually sitting in this chair on the ground. Really, sitting in the chair right next to you. I, I would just suspect you were probably holding that baby in your lap. How old is the baby now? He's six weeks. Six weeks. Congratulations to both of you. You're both terrific. I can't thank you enough. I'll send you the video of this clip because you're going to love it, both of you. Wonderful. Okay. All right. You. Good to see you, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Bye. Bye. See you Bye. Later. Nice job. Nice job. Really good.